Well, everyone, here we are, by far the most requested video of the last several months. It's time we talk about Hocus Focus. Welcome back, everyone. Chatter Patriot Astro here. Today we have a video that I know you've all been waiting for. How do I know this? Oh, I don't know, something like 61 emails and a whole bunch of Discord messages. So let's not waste any more time. What is Hocus Focus? To start, it's a plugin for Nina 2.0, written and maintained by George Helios, who you may know from Discord as Joko Geo. George is an active Nina developer and also has a couple other plugins out there. You might recognize him from 10 Micron Tools and his new Orbitals plugin. Most of you who have already heard about Hocus Focus probably think of it as better autofocus. Well, you're not wrong, but there's more to it than that. There's actually more to the plugin both before and after the autofocus part. But let me explain. See, here's the thing. For autofocus to work and work well, you need star detection to work. Simple, right? Not exactly. If I look at an exposure, I don't want to use all the stars in the star field for autofocus. Several aren't suitable for autofocus. Maybe some stars are oversaturated, too dim, too eccentric, too flat, or even too distorted. It can be more challenging than that too. Like, what if a double star is detected as a single star? Or what if something that isn't even a star is detected as a star? Like bright nebulosity, or maybe a galaxy. Hocus Focus helps with the before part of the autofocus process by adding a new star detection and star annotation process. The way Hocus Focus improves upon star detection should actually help just about everyone one way or another. When you exclude bad stars, and only include the best stars, your focus will improve. With better star detection and selection, the autofocus part of the plugin can really shine. The new autofocus engine also has the ability to save and replay previous autofocus runs. That may not make sense to you right now, but you'll see how helpful that can be when we get to it later. What about the after part of the plugin? This is really cool stuff. Hocus Focus adds an aberration inspector that can help you measure and resolve optical issues like back focus and sensor tilt. Just for the record, I'm really excited about this feature because my C8SCT imaging field was absolute trash. This plugin is helping me identify which issues are correctable through physical adjustments to the imaging train and also ones I couldn't correct for that were related to poor optics. In simpler terms, it's helping me correct what I've been forced to crop out of my pictures for years. And after talking to George, he has some great plans for additional development of this capability. And not like pretty interface plans, but like working with optical engineer science -y plans. Before I jump into Nina and show you this stuff in action, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and of course like the video if you like the video. I've had so many people suggest a Patreon account to me so they can support my efforts, and while I don't feel like I'm quite ready for that yet, the easiest way to support me is to go into the video description. From there, you can find my affiliate links for Amazon, OPT, or High Point Scientific. I get a small amount of compensation if you happen to click one of those links and then make a purchase. Of course, at no cost to you. Any purchase you make after clicking one of those links will work until you either click someone else's link, complete your purchase by closing out your shopping cart, or some number of days later, depending on the vendor. Please don't feel like you need to do this. I'm still gonna make content. This just makes my family happier with all of the time I spend doing this. Okay, here we go. Abracadabra. Oh wait, Hocus Focus. Here we are in Nina Beta 2.0. I'm using my Celestron C8 SCT operating around 1450 millimeters using a brand new Starzona reducer corrector that I just installed in my imaging train moments before starting this video. I'm using the documented back focus distance and before pressing record found focus manually. So this is first light and we'll see what happens. You can see I have all my devices already connected so we're good to go. First let's get into the available plugins page and locate the Hocus Focus plugin. You can see the description and capabilities here and if needed install the plugin. I already have mine installed. After it's installed, go to the Installed Plugins page for Hocus Focus, and you'll see some configuration elements. We'll get to the configuration in a bit. Now before going any further, let me show you some of my configuration. Let's go to Options Autofocus and see what I have. Notice I have Use Filter Offsets turned off. I also have my initial offset steps to 4. I'm using Star HFR and Hyperbolic. And I have a step size of 600 and a default exposure time limit of 8 seconds. I've also already configured my overshoot compensation to 2400. 
For anyone that hasn't configured autofocus yet in Nina, I'll share some high level methodology later in this video and also point you to some other videos that will show you how to do that as well. Now let's go to options, imaging, and see that I'm using Nina for star detection, annotation, and autofocus. So even though Hocus Focus is installed, I'm not using it yet. I wanna level set our discussion today by showing you Nina first. Let me turn on annotation here, and we'll go take an exposure the same length as defined by my autofocus configuration. If you remember, that was eight seconds. By the way, during this video, all autofocus runs, exposures, and anything else that's time consuming will be sped up or even cut out in the video to keep all of you from drifting off to sleep. No time for naps here, sorry. Okay, this is the eight second exposure and we can see some annotations. Now these are from Nina, not Hocus Focus. Zoom in and we can see some of Nina's star detection and hey look, the trapezium cluster. You know, it's the little things that keep us happy, right? These are all HFR values of the selected stars. Let's run Nina through an autofocus cycle. Again, this is not Hocus Focus yet. That surprisingly is pretty good for a brand new reducer stuck in the imaging train just minutes ago without testing. If that isn't a selling point, I don't know what is. I'll put the link for this reducer corrector in the description and I'll likely do a video on this later because at first glance, this is a huge upgrade from my old Celestron reducer. All right, so the completed Nina autofocus run position is at 73,982 with an HFR of 4.17. It's 1.0 for the hyperbolic R squared line fitting and took about three minutes and 26 seconds to complete. Pay no attention to the temperature. I actually removed the probe after installing my new electronic rotator because the connector was in the way and honestly, I wasn't using that probe anyway. So let's go take another eight second image and zoom in and look around. Detection doesn't look too bad, but you can see a lot of the ellipses aren't centered and in this case here, we're catching part of a double star. See, here's the thing. If detection isn't accurate, focus won't be either. So we've looked at the in-focus exposure, but now let's see how detection works at the edge of focus. Going back to the autofocus curve, we can see the edge of my autofocus was at about 76,400. So let's go there and take another exposure. All right, here's the new image. You can see some pretty big donuts here, and they're leaning outside of the ellipses. I'm not too sure how accurate these HFR values are, but it's what Nina found. Anyway, let's go back to in focus before moving on. So now we've seen Nina's detection, annotation, and autofocus. It's time to look at Hocus Focus. To do that, we need to enable it in Options Imaging. Notice that you can choose what pieces to enable. You don't need to turn it all on, but you probably will. Now that it's enabled, let's take another eight second exposure. See the change? Let me toggle back and forth a couple times. Some of what you're noticing is just labeling and font, but there are some star detection differences as well as an overall HFR change as a result. In this case, the HFR went from 4.3 to 3.87. Let's zoom in. First, we notice we have detection boxes now that seem to be a bit tighter to the stars and maybe even better aligned. Here's another superpower of Hocus Focus. It gives us control instead of a black box methodology we cannot see or affect. To see the controls, we need to enable the new plugin panels. Now they may be already turned on for you, but if not, let's do that here now. First up here is the star detection results. Clicking that opens it in the larger imaging area as a tab. I'm gonna move this tab over here as a tab on the HFR history and resize it. Next is the aberration inspector. I'm gonna leave it here, and full disclosure, we won't get back here until the end of the video, but don't skip ahead, trust me. Now, star detection options, and if this looks familiar, it's the same as what we can find on the plugin page. This saves me from having to go back and forth into the plugin. Let's move this as a tab over here. And finally, star annotation options. Let's tab this one over into the same place. It's also another plugin configuration page, as you can see. There are also autofocus configuration options on the plugin page, but that section doesn't have a panel and imaging because it isn't needed there. So now we're looking at an image that's been detected and annotated by Hocus Focus, but this time we have granular control over annotation. And of course, I can easily show and hide these annotations. It's important that you understand that the stars that are annotated here are called detected stars. These are the best stars found suitable for autofocus. 
Many more candidate stars were found in the image, but they were discarded for all sorts of reasons. I can choose to show all detected stars, or just a maximum number of the brightest of the best stars suitable for autofocus. Since this is my C8 at about 1450 millimeters, I have less than 100 detected stars here. You can see this info down in the detected stars results panel. Let's change the maximum stars to 50. If I toggle all stars on and off, I'll see everything detected, or just the 50 brightest of the best. Now if you zoom in, you'll see some other changes. Notice we now have a bounding box. Ideally, we want this to be tight to the star and as centered as possible. You can show or hide the box, change its color, and even change it to an ellipse or PSF, but leave it as a box. Right now the annotation on screen is in HFR, but we can change that. We can also see FWHM, eccentricity, or PSF rotation. And why not? If Hocus Focus is going to calculate and use the data, why not give us access to it? By the way, if you like technical stuff like this and want a better understanding of HFR or FWHM and want to go deeper, you need to subscribe to James Lamb's YouTube channel. It's a fantastic and one-of-a-kind channel. I'll link that in the description too. Don't leave here yet, but go there next. All right, are the annotations too small or you don't like the Arial font? Change what you want and make it yours. The next one is a crossover with autofocus configuration, show ROI. If you have an inner or outer cropping defined in your autofocus configuration, you can show that here. This will be used both for autofocus and also calculations on images when using the plugin. Let me change my inner crop here to 0.8 just so you can see what's happening. This can be useful if you end up with optically poor stars in the edge of your imaging field, like say my SCT about 30 minutes ago before I pulled out that crummy Celestron reducer. I can basically tell the system to ignore the edge stars in my calculation so those ugly stars don't affect my focus curve. Star center detection is also critical to the calculations. You can show the star center is selected by the plugin or hide it if you prefer. Everything we just covered in the new star annotator was in relation to detected stars or the good stars. What about the ones that were discarded? That's what these options are down here. We can show any combination of distorted, degenerate, saturated, low sensitivity, uncentered, or just flat stars. If we look at the detection results panel, we can see how many of each were discarded. And some are bundled into other categories, by the way. Here we see that we had 121 low sensitivity stars. They're big enough, but too dim to use. Let's look at them, though, by toggling them on. The change may not be initially obvious until we zoom in, but here you are. What about the nine saturated stars? They're pretty obvious, but here you go. Poor star selection makes for poor HFR calculations, which will affect your focus point. Bad data in makes for bad data out. It's better to discard a good star than to include a bad star. Remember that. The star detector also includes some of the final calculations as well. HFR and HFR SD, etc. It's important to understand that we're supposedly working with high precision equipment here, and therefore we have expectations of a relatively flat field across the entire sensor. With that being said, we should expect most stars to be roughly the same size as measured by HFR. This isn't how reality works though. We should be pretty close, but the amount of dispersion across the entire image is the HFR SD value. We would like this to be maybe 10% of the HFR value. So if your HFR is 5.0, then the HFR SD should be about 0.5 or less. Here my HFR is 3.88 and my HFR SD is 0.21. So 0.21 divided by 3.88 is about 5.5%. Looks nice and even across the field. By the way, the HFR SD is also viewable in the form of those vertical black error bars on each point plotted on your autofocus chart. All right, so that was the new star annotator, or basically how we visually present data about the current exposure. But how does Hocus Focus detect stars suitable for autofocus, and can we influence that process? Yes, absolutely. And for that, we go to the star detection options. Before I review any of this, I want to be clear about a couple items. Throughout early development of the plugin, there was a lot of feedback provided. As a result, the detection engine was fine-tuned to work out of the box for the most common use cases. With that being said, we are provided the ability to make changes, and we can do that with the basic mode like you see here with a couple simple drop-down options, or 
through an advanced mode that provides granular control over many aspects of detection. Okay, my point here though, only modify it if you need to. And start with the basic options before you go digging around in the advanced section. Working back up the list here in basic mode, first I'll talk about focus range with options of typical or wide range. If your equipment presents large donut shaped stars as you get further away from the critical focus zone to the point where they're not being detected as stars during autofocus, you can change to wide range. This increases the number of wavelet layers used during detection so that larger objects can be located, but it comes with the risk of incorrectly detecting some nebulosity of stars as well. Next, we have pixel scale with options of typical, wide field, and long focal length. Because at high focal lengths, your pixel scale will decrease, the apparent star size and pixels will increase. Setting this to a high focal length also increases the number of wavelet layers for detection, with the same risk of increased nebulosity I just mentioned. In my experience with a reducer on my C8SCT operating around 1200 to 1400 millimeters, I'm right on the edge of needing to push this setting to long focal length from typical. Beyond that focal length, it would almost certainly be helpful. Of course, with wide field, we have the opposite issue. And finally, we have noise level with options of typical, none, and high. This setting controls the amount of blurring done to the source image before detection occurs. You may need to increase this at long focal lengths or if you have a noisy sensor. Beyond those basic options, you have use autofocus crop, which tells the system to use the ROI cropping during autofocus that I showed earlier, and also fit PSF, which is going to be required to be on for calculation of FWHM and eccentricity. You'll almost definitely leave these to on unless you're severely processor limited, and then maybe you turn off fit PSF, but I wouldn't. Debug mode and save intermediate shouldn't be needed, and they are primarily for development purposes. Now we click advanced and immediately wish we didn't. Lots of options. Detection's no longer a black box. You can control all of it. Remember, only go here if you really need to do so. I'm not gonna talk through all of this. George has promised documentation at some point, but for now, just understand most of this was originally made available as a way for him to tweak the detection fundamentals quickly without a code release. The default settings are already tuned, so you should be fine out of the box. But since there are so many, let me mention at least two of them. First, structure layers. Remember when I mentioned some basic settings that increased wavelet layers for detection? This is the same thing. You can change this manually and increase it beyond the basic settings if needed. We also have brightness sensitivity here. If you decrease this value, you'll cause previously low sensitivity rejected stars to now be detected. Hey, wake up. Don't worry about all this. Keep it simple. Start with the defaults, then tweak the basic parameters if necessary. Only go into advanced if absolutely needed. If your optics are really bad or really good, you may find yourself in advanced. Everyone else shouldn't worry so much. If you're a long focal length user, Still start with the defaults and then maybe try wide range and long focal length and then move on to advanced. All right, time to run through some of the process. We're already starting with an in-focus image on my C8 SCT running at F7 around 1450 millimeters. This is always a bit of a challenge as the focal length's a bit high and the field of view limits our access to stars. Additionally, with an SCT, you tend to get dimmer stars towards the edge of your field as the light intensity falls off. To start, Let's change the pixel scale to long focal length and take an eight second exposure. We'll zoom in to see the current view and the changes as it occurs. Notice the detection boxes got bigger and the HFR increased as a result. Also notice the detection metrics of course changed since the detected stars changed. Let's move out to the edge of my focus run and look at some out of focus stars. We need to detect those as well or we'll never get a good curve. A new image here shows us those donut shaped stars but we do seem to have decent detection, which is good. Even as donuts, they're within tightly centered boxes, which is better than the default Nina mechanism did originally. Although like Nina, we possibly picked up some nebulosity. This could actually be a star since the software is certainly better at seeing a pixel variation than we are. Let's try to add wide range to the equation. Take a picture and see what happens. In this case, not too much. Let's set both back to typical and see how it looks with the defaults while at the edge of focus. This seems to be working even at 1450 millimeters. Let's go back to in focus. Okay, well at this point, this is the overall process using the annotation and detection configuration options. Check your system and settings both in focus 
and at the edge of focus detection. Time to move on to autofocus with Hocus Focus. Click on the autofocus tab. Notice anything new here? We now have a reprocessed save run button. Before we can use this, we need to head back to the plugin for some configuration. On the plugin page, there are just a couple settings I want to mention. First, validate HFR improvement. This will take an exposure and measure its HFR prior to starting autofocus. It will also take an image at the end of the process and do the same. It will compare the two images and only accept the run if the HFR improved. You can actually use this along with the built-in R-squared line fitting validation. We can also turn on save and then enter a save path. This allows you to retain lots of information, raw images, annotated images, and lots of JSON files with data about every aspect of autofocus as it occurs. Do not leave this on all the time. It creates lots of files and saves lots of photos. I'll turn it on and set a new folder to save the data during our testing and tuning. Now we'll go back to autofocus and kick one off. I should remind you that during this video, my target's been falling quite a bit, so the air mass I'm imaging through is increasing. Don't expect a big HFR improvement here. While this autofocus cycle runs, let's briefly review the overall autofocus configuration process to make sure we're all on the same page, or at least in the same chapter of the same book. First, you need to start manually near focus. Doesn't have to be perfect, just near focus. Now we need to find a good starting step size. Move your focus until your blurry HFR is about three to four times the starting HFR you had previously. Divide how much you move the focuser by your initial offset step count on the configuration page, which is often three or four. The result is a good step size. So if you start at position 1000 on your focuser with an HFR of three and move to position 1040 with an HFR of 12, and you have an initial offset step size of four in your autofocus configuration, just do the math. 1,040 minus 1,000 is 40, then divide that by four initial steps and you get 10. So 10 is a good starting step size. Now try an autofocus run. If you have a flat section at one edge of the curve, or if it starts to bend back away from the curve, that's likely backlash. Figure out from the graphic how many focus or steps that seems to be, and apply that to either in or out, but not both, of the overshoot method on the autofocus configuration page. Run autofocus again, and if needed, adjust your step size until you have a good U-shaped curve, with the highest HFR at the edges being about three to four times the lowest HFR at the bottom point. Continue to adjust backlash and step size until you're happy with the curve. Of course, make sure you have good star detection and consider other things that can help too, like modifying exposure lengths for narrowband filters versus broadband filters, and using something like intercropping if your flattener isn't quite flat all the way to the edge. Now you have a great curve and you're finally happy? Great. Move on and maybe consider things like filter offsets too. All right, now that that's covered, let's get back to our first Hocus Focus autofocus run. That's a very nice curve, and I think I could eventually even lose some of the initial steps to speed it up by going from four down to three initial steps. Now that it's completed, let's look at the saved files. Notice that for each focus run, it has its own folder, and inside that are attempt and final folders. The final folder has the JSON data about the image as well as raw and annotated final images. The attempt folder also has the same data, but for each and every individual image that was taken during the focus run. Here's where this gets interesting. I want to make a change to my detection parameters and see if it helps or hurts my star detection. But the next time I take an image or run autofocus, I may have different seeing conditions, a light breeze, you name it. It isn't really a scientific way to approach this. But now, because I saved a previous focus run, I can make a change and retest on the same data. Let's check it out by changing the noise level and pixel scale. Now click the button and select our attempt folder. You can see at the bottom of Nina, instead of taking pictures and moving my focuser around, I'm actually looking at the previous files. This methodology is a lot quicker too. This will only take about 45 seconds instead of three and a half minutes. Now you can compare this to the original data to see what gives you the best results. So far I've been looking at my luminance filter, but don't forget to check some of the others for detection as well. Here's a 30 second hydrogen alpha exposure with default settings, and you can see we have a much lower star count. Let me run an autofocus with this filter. 
Well, I'm glad I did that. Seems we suffer a potential issue further away from focus. How would you deal with this sort of issue? Well, easy. Since I'm saving autofocus runs, let's go pull that image. As I expected, nothing was annotated, meaning nothing here was detected as a suitable star. Looking at the image slightly closer to focus was a bit iffy as well, but at least something was detected. To try to correct this issue from occurring again, we can determine the focus position of the failure and manually move to that point. Now we'll take an image of the length of my typical exposure for autofocus. Okay, this time we got a bit lucky and detected a single star, but that's not exactly quite the buffer I was hoping for. What if we increase the exposure length for this filter to 10 seconds? Or maybe we try wide range or adding layers in advanced. I think based on what I saw before in luminance, I'll try to stick with wide range and for my narrowband filters, setting a longer exposure length. It could be argued that another option would be to decrease my initial steps from four to three so I never got that far from focus in the first place. And that would work too, assuming I start close enough to focus. It's certainly something to consider. As a final thought on autofocus, for those of you that are more paranoid than others, you may want to move around the sky and test the parameters on other objects. Here you can see I'm testing against a galaxy to make sure I'm not detecting the core as a star. I know some of you have been waiting for this part of the video, an introduction to aberration inspection and potential tilt correction. Before you dive in, know that autofocus via hocus focus needs to be right before going down this path, meaning detection has to be working. Do not jump ahead to this feature. Know what you're getting yourself into as well. While no astrophotographers were physically harmed during the filming of this video, there were a lot of parts and connectors ordered, and there was also a C8 that almost learned how to fly when it wasn't behaving. The goal of this part of the plugin is to get data about your imaging field as presented on your camera sensor. If your back focus distance could be better or your camera sensor is tilted, we can see that and possibly help you correct it. This isn't click and it is fixed though. It takes time multiple iterations of physical adjustments, and lots of testing. It also takes an understanding of the various optical aberrations you may be experiencing. See, something like flexure can appear to be sensor tilt, but tilt and flexure are addressed very differently. A flattener you may have that cannot truly flatten all the way out to the edge may look like a back focus issue, but it isn't. And something like poor collimation can confuse everything. Am I trying to scare you away from this feature? No, well, maybe. My advice is to make sure you've addressed everything else before trying to correct minor tilt. Back focus, well, almost everyone can win by fixing that, but tilt, be prepared for a journey. Before we jump back into Nina, a couple things. For aberration inspection to work, you need to see enough stars and have them be visible across the entire field of view of your image. I like using a field of view near but not directly on a nebula since most nebula are going to be in our galaxy and include lots of Milky Way stars. I'm going to image near Malat 15 for my example. Once there, take an exposure to ensure you have enough stars visual throughout the entire image, all the way into the corners. This is important because the tool is going to break your image up into a 3x3 three three grid. It's going to look at that grid and use specifically the four corners and the center for all of its calculations. It's possible and likely that this process becomes even more granular as the plugin continues to mature, so it may change by the time you see this video. Like everything in Nina, development is fast and new capabilities are always around every corner. Time to open the Aberration Inspection tab. We can perform a detailed or simple analysis. There are a few configuration options available, but as a start, let's just run a simple analysis which uses a single exposure. I'll increase the exposure length to 12 seconds to hopefully get more stars across the entire field. The simple analysis first provides an FWHM contour map. In a perfect world with uniform stars, we would like to see the same FWHM everywhere, but this is the real world, and we don't all live on mountaintops with huge plane wave telescopes. Below this is the eccentricity vector diagram. This can help you understand your back focus based on the pattern. Again, in a perfect world, this would be uniform with vectors all under maybe 0.3. But since I just dropped this new reducer in my imaging train at an estimated back focus distance, I'm pretty surprised it isn't much worse. If you aren't familiar with back focus star shape patterns, I'll put a link in the description, but it looks something like this. 
this is certainly another topic for another day. As far as interpreting this diagram, the line represents both the direction of the eccentricity as well as the amount. As a side note, if we go back to the image, we can change the annotator to show eccentricity if we want to more thoroughly investigate. Don't forget, having multiple optical issues in your imaging train will play against you. So also think about collimation, tilt, flexure, and coma correction, among others. Fixing one issue can have an effect on the others. So this process can end up taking several rounds. Find ways to limit issues you may be experiencing to focus on others. As an example, to take flexure out of the equation, maybe perform your tests on a star field near Zenith straight up. Now let's take a look at the detailed analysis. This uses an entire autofocus run or a previously saved run. I'll start a new one. As the autofocus executes, it takes images at offset steps as you'd expect, but instead of running the autofocus calculation on the entire image one time per image, it runs autofocus five times per image, once per corner and once in the center. You'll see all five lines plotted at the same time as it executes. Another nice feature of this interface is that you can zoom in with your scroll wheel on the mouse and even pan around by right-click dragging. A double right-click will return you to the original view. Once it completes, it will present you with the findings. First, notice the back focus error. This suggests how you should possibly increase or decrease your back focus distance from the sensor to the flattener or the end of your optical train. This is estimated by the difference in HFR mean for the corners to the center. This value is in focuser steps. So if you know the number of microns per step of your focuser, you can granularly calculate and adjust your back focus. Below this, we have sensor tilt estimates. Unfortunately, the graphic on the right today is a little challenging to see, so let me put another one on the screen for a second. This gives you an idea of how the sensor is tilted in relation to the telescope body light path. The latest version of the plugin has some additional wording to explain how to interpret this image and where to envision your camera body versus the telescope body. That graphic, though, is just a visual representation of the data from the table on the left. Using this information would allow you to adjust for tilt and retest until you ended up with a flatter and less tilted sensor. It should be noted that the graphic on the right is always the same size. It's the scaled values that change. Because of this, small tilt can appear to be large tilt, so pay attention to the numbers. Please don't forget that while this is great, know your equipment and have realistic expectations. If you bought your telescope off the shelf from Costco, don't expect miracles. There are a lot of other optical issues to address before any amount of tilt that isn't visually obvious becomes your real problem. To wrap up the report, below tilt, we have tilt history, so you can track your adjustments and corrections. We also have another FWHM contour map and eccentricity map to go along with the tilt information. To give you an idea of what you can accomplish, here's a recent set of images shared with me by George, the developer of Hocus Focus, on how he used it to correct his sensor alignment. Here's the before and here's the after. He used an octopi to make the fine adjustments, but depending on your telescope model and type, backspace availability, and budget, you'll have various options to solve your own issues. Everything from the octopi to Gerd Neumann tilters to shims are available. I also wanted to share just one more thing as validation of the aberration inspector output. And we may see something like this within Hocus Focus soon. Here's the output from CCD inspector run on images from my C8's very new and untested imaging train. You can see it's detected the tilt in the same exact direction the plugin detected. It saw the tilt oriented from left to right at 93 degrees rotation, just like the plugin did. So while CCD Inspector does include some additional features, you may not need to put off that new filter purchase to run out and buy a copy of it. But if you're like me, you might do that anyway. All right, that wraps up today's video. I hope you found value in this introduction to Hocus Focus. Please like, subscribe, and share this video with others. Remember to check in the description for the links I mentioned throughout the video so you can continue your research. I have a lot more video content coming, but personally, I hope some of it will be a lot easier to create and produce than this video was. Now go back to correcting your optics. Have a great day, have a great night, and of course, clear skies.